is effective interest rate. And if you are in a bank or an NBFC, or if you are auditing a bank or an NBFC, it can be a nightmarish time for you in the IND AS world. Basically, what the IND AS requires is all your interest, income, and expenses on an amortized cost instrument are to be recognized at the effective interest rate, not the coupon. And that's important because in financial services, we see there are many banks that basically take a lot of fees upfront, take call it as a processing fee, advisory fee, and then have a lower interest coupon. Now, the standard says in reality, all of this is time value of money. You have to spread it out over the life of the loan. And the way to do it is effective interest rate. But if you are a bank, you have a portfolio of like say how many lakhs of loans or 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs of such loans, it becomes very cumbersome operationally. And therefore this concept of EIR is very critical. Uh, in simplistic terms, EIR is nothing else but the IRR of a loan or a yield of the loan. You take into account all the origination fees and costs. But an important point to drive home is this has to be attributable and incremental. And how do I distinguish between the two? So let's say today I go and take a loan from a bank and the bank charges me 2% interest uh, for processing the loan. I am incurring that 2% purely because I'm going to get the loan. Isn't it? Had I not taken the loan, I would not have paid 2% to the bank. It is attributable where I'm able to draw a connection and it is only because the loan is coming into the books. Now flip the example as a business. I give my employees an incentive saying if you go and sell 10 crore rupees of loans a month, I will give you a bonus. Now that bonus is a performance bonus in a lot of cases. And therefore, because it's a performance bonus, it may be attributable, but it is not incremental. It could be a bonus which is getting to do other piece of work also. So both attributable and incremental is important. Uh, again, scope for management to try and spread costs, try and book incomes up, up front. Please do factor this in when you do the risk assessments on your audits, if you're auditing an NBFC or a bank under India's. Now coming back to the accounting guidance, financial asset or a liability which is not at fair value, Basically, you record it at amortized cost and there is an adjustment to EIR, which is the yield or the spread over of fees and costs. FEOCI also account for on an EIR basis. Liabilities are also accounted for on an EIR basis. Now let's take again a few examples to quickly go through this. Uh, we have spilled over a bit, but I'm okay. Let's, I think it's important we at least cover this first. And now I will keep the chat box open. Company XYZ has purchased investments in equity shares of 10 million and pays a brokerage of 0.5%. How do you account for this brokerage as a transaction cost? So two things on the chat box. First is uh, what will be the classification? And second thing, uh, how do you measure this transaction cost? This is the financial instruments impact uh, is heavy standard, very difficult to sustain. Please bear with me for 10 minutes. Uh, I think we will be through just 10 minutes of focus and we will get it. Most of us know the answer. Uh, let's just five, 10 minutes. That's right. Now we are getting it. Now we are getting to where we were. Okay. Perfect. So equity instruments, they are shares. So it has to be FETPL. My apologies for the spellings and the typos, but I'm speaking as I type or typing as I speak. 
uh, FETPL, we said the rule is immediately expensed. So for FETPL, expense immediately. No amortization. For a second example, debentures are issued and the auditor says, look, it's a public issue. I will have to issue a comfort letter to the bankers. I will issue certificates and I will charge a X rupees of fee. That is right. We are getting answers already. It is at amortized cost. Okay. Okay. Mixed answers, mixed answers. So first step uh, is the classification as an invest. I am an issuer. This is a financial liability for a financial liability. I'm incurring cost liability will be at amortized cost because it's principal and interest. And this fee is directly attributable and incremental. And hence it is EIR. So it goes through PNL, but as a part of the amortization, it does not automatically go to PNL. As a lender, if you give a loan and charge a fee processing fee upfront, again, it is a directly attributable and incremental fee and it has to go through PNL. I mean, it has to go through effective interest rate. Right. So basically the real challenge in all of this is trying to find out what are the upfront fees and costs that are attributable and incremental. And this is a very relevant audit challenge also, because think about it as management. If I'm in the business of giving loans and charging fees upfront, my intention will always be to try and show more fee income upfront. Two reasons. One, it shows that I have fee income, which does not use capital. So it makes my business model look better and two money is coming upfront, but in reality, it is just upfronted interest. So that's an audit risk that we have to deal with when we audit NBFCs and banks. So the assessment in this example, and I'll maybe quickly go through is principal. There is a 2% interest charged. Now answer is, is the bank charging this only because of the loan? The answer is yes, absolutely. So I have to factor this in. So when I, on day one, if I am the bank, I will basically say my disbursal is thousand, but I have collected 20. So the loan and amount on day one is thousand minus 20. I have also incurred 5 million. So it's thousand minus 20 minus five. This is also done only because I'm giving the loan. Now performance bonus of 3 million to an employee who sourced the loan. This is tricky as an auditor. This needs assessment of facts. If the only condition for this bonus was getting the loan, this is also a transaction cost, which is eligible. But if you tell him we will pay you 3 million provided that the loan continues to be performing for six months or performing for one year then it is like a normal performance incentive that is outside the calculation of a amortized cost or transaction. Costs. So to summarize the effective interest rate method concept, amortized cost is amount on initial recognition minus cash you receive plus interest or in interest income or expense. That's the amortized cost. EIR is the rate that exactly discounts future cash receipts and payments through the expected life. So simply put, this is the IRR, something that we would have all been familiar or learned. Right now, what is relevant to keep in mind is expected life of the instrument. A lot of times we end up missing this because uh, many of us may have taken a home loan or may have taken other loans. Just think about your own situation today. If I have taken a home loan, the contractual life of that loan is 20 years. But in many cases, we don't let the home loan run for 20 years because we would like to get our home loan 
freed up as quickly as possible. So the moment we get a bonus, and we used to get some in pre-COVID days, we immediately go and prepay the loan. Right. So effectively, if you see home loans get prepaid in a matter of eight to ten years. So the standard says if there is a processing fee a bank or an NBFC has collected, amortize it over eight years, not twenty years. Very important, very relevant item to be covered in implementation of India in those situations. Finally, consider all contractual terms, options, prepayments. Factor all of those in when you calculate the EIR. Now, very commonly we see floating rate loans. In the problem in a floating rate loan is we don't know what are those payments and when they are going to actually happen because today I don't know the LIBOR or I don't know MCLR. <clears throat> Standard gives two possible approaches. The first approach is is basically to say you take the rates that are available today, work out the amortization. Alternative two is every balance sheet date you make a projection of what your expected cash flows are going to be, and then you amortize. Finally, as a more practical solution, if you believe straight lining reflects the time value of money better. You are allowed to straight line your fees and costs, but again requires assessment, documentation, and documentation of judgment. Okay, this is something that I actually wanted to spend some time on. Uh, practically, and why don't I leave? Maybe for two minutes, I leave the chat box open. Uh, have you all encountered situations where you have to do EIR for the entire portfolio if you are auditing an NBFC or a bank? So the problem statement is on India's transition. Data is not in system. System cannot auto calculate amortization or EIR. Have you dealt with this situation before? Uh, if you have not dealt with this, you are fortunate. Uh, if you have, look at the end of the day, accounting is not a natural science. right? You can take different approaches to calculate EIR. So for example, when I talk of home loan, I know on an average how does the home loan behave. So I know that if I have to give someone a loan for 8 years, what would have been the pattern of amortization of that loan? I use that pattern and develop a standard amortization table. And that is what I use to amortize my loan. Now I'm sorry, I'm not able to. I am trying to open my Excel, which has an example. Sorry, I'll just stop sharing once and then go back and share my Excel. Yeah. Uh, I hope my Excel Excel sheet is visible. If it is, uh, one of you can just quickly. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, visible. Okay. Uh, column D. But you can slightly increase the font size. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Sure. B column can be increased also. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's perfect. Now let's let's take a simple example of a loan, where the loan is of of uh, whatever hundred of ten million or one crore rupees loan. The rate of interest is is four percent. And there is an upfront fee of 3 lakhs that is charged. 
Now, if you had to draw a simple Indian gap schedule, you would simply have taken this 3 lakh rupees upfront and recognize interest, income, or expense at 4%. And that's how you would have done the accounting. Under index, when we talk of an EIR method, basically what we have to do is we have to split the EMI on the loan into repayment of principal and interest. Right? So, so my starting point of the loan is not 1 crore, but it's 97 lakhs because I have to adjust the 3 lakh also. Then I find out what is my IRR or XIRR. So basically I know the cash flows. I have to make sure I get to 97 lakhs on day one. Whatever is the difference is basically the amortization of the upfront fee. So now I know that my rate of interest effectively is 5.5%. So I charge 5.5% interest on 97 lakhs instead of 4% on one crore. And this is the interest income that I recognize in my PNL. Under Indian Gap, I would have recognized 33,000, which is 4% of 1 crore for one month. Therefore, this is the difference that you will see on a period by period basis. Overall, you see the total differential equals the upfront fee. This fee got booked upfront in Indian Gap under day one. Now, what I'm suggesting is to do this for one loan is possible. To do this for 10 loans is also possible, but it's not possible to do this for 100 loans. It's not possible to do this for 10 lakh loans. In such a case, effectively, what you do is you build up a model. You say that if I had a loan with these terms, how would my amortization pattern look like? I would have amortized X rupees in the first month, second rupees in the second month. I use that as a ratio to find out my amortization. So basically I, I say 11,000 rupees out of my fee gets amortized in the first month. Which is 3% of the fee. So if for every loan on a blanket basis, I apply 3% amortization. Not scientifically and accurately correct, but the difference is not material. Helps you to deal with a larger volume uh, and get to a more accurate answer. Again, there could be multiple approaches. I will also share this Excel so you can look at it at leisure uh, and look at the different approaches that are possible. In summary, basically to make the point short, if you had to plot how a graph of an actual amortization would look like, versus how a, how a graph based on a product level or an average portfolio level would look like, they are both very, very similar. They both run parallel and they're nearly the same in terms of the amounts. And that therefore is practically the better approach uh, that we have seen.